Hi, I'm Sally Moore and I'm from the Rural Planning Company and I'm going to talk to you for the next 20 minutes or so on planning permission for camping and glamping. Okay, I'm going to be covering when do I need planning permission, what can I do without planning permission, who decides a planning application and what do they take into account and finishing with some top tips for a successful application. I'm going to start off with some planning basics. So what is development? Operational development is the carrying out of building, engineering, mining or other works, so physical works to the site. And change of use is the making of any material change of the use of any building or land. If your project is development, then most forms of development do require planning permission. Sometimes permitted development applies, which is legislation that expressly states that you are permitted to carry it out without further permission. Operational development includes things like hard standing or concrete. That could be a base that something else is sat on top of, or it could be an access track or a parking area. It's also any physical fixed structure which can't be easily lifted off the ground. For example, a cabin, a lodge, a tree house, things like that, but also smaller things like a roof over a wash area, a deck for a hot tub, or installation of drainage facilities like a package treatment plant. Change of use covers both land and buildings and, for example, covers using land for camping, siting of a mobile structure like a caravan or a shepherd's hut, or even using an existing building as undercover seating in connection with a wider use of the site. The question, do I need planning permission, is always safest to assume yes, unless any of these apply. So permitted development rights, or if the Caravan Act allows your project, or if the site's licensed by an exempt organisation, and I'll come on to those now. So permitted development is under the Town and Country Planning Permitted Development Order, Schedule 2, and there's four sections which are of most relevance, which I'll, I'll summarise now. Part 1, Class E, covers buildings which are incidental to the enjoyment of a dwelling house within the curtilage of a house. For example, citing a shepherd's hut in your garden for personal use only, for use such as an office or a summer house or something like that. It doesn't allow you to let it out or use it other than in connection with your house, such as a standalone residential unit. So this doesn't really allow camping and glamping, but if you want to have that kind of structure in your garden for that use, then this is where it might come under. Part four, class B, covers temporary uses of land. Now this isn't allowed within the curtilage of a, of a building, so it can't be used in your garden, things like that, but it does allow use for most uses. There are some exceptions, but most things you can do for up to 28 days in any calendar year per planning unit. Planning unit is quite an important thing to mention here, that the planning unit isn't as simple as per field or per your garden or something like that, or per the site that your shepherd's hut is sited on. If you've got a farm that's 100 acres, the chances are that whole site will be considered your planning unit. The same if you've got a house and garden or a house and paddock, then that will be your planning unit. If you've got something like a shepherd's hut, you can't, it's not as simple as just having it in one site for 28 days and then picking it up and moving it over for the next 28 days. That 28 days is the total for your whole site, your whole planning unit. In 2020 and 2021, the 28 days was extended to 56 to allow for industry recovery following COVID. But there's no talks at the moment of that being extended for 2022. So it's safe to assume we'll be back to the 28 day rule. And don't forget, this doesn't allow caravans or operational development. Caravans come under part five, class A which covers the use of land as a caravan site, but actually just refers to circumstances under the Caravan Sites and Control of Development Act, which I'll come on to in a second. And part five, class C, covers use of land by members of certain recreational organisations. So specific organisations hold a certificate of exemption under section 269 of the Public Health Act. And if you are a member of one of those organisations, then you might then be able to operate without needing planning permission. So the Caravan Act to start off with, this isn't quite as open a use as the normal temporary use of land for up to 28 days per year, but it does allow if you have more than five acres for you to have up to three caravans on the site for no more than 28 days per year. It's important to note that the 56 day ex extension doesn't apply here. This is only it's always just been 28 days. If you've got less than five acres, then you can have one touring caravan at a time for no more than two nights in a row and for no more than 28 days per year again. Exempt organisations is where if you are a member of a specific club, then you might be able to operate a site without needing planning permission. Rules vary per club. 
and depending on what type of exemption license they hold, for example, some cover a maximum of five pitches, they might be caravan pitches only, they might be caravan and tents, or they might just be for things like rallies. Some have restrictions on whether you can have touring versus static units and who can stay on site, whether you can only have mem other members of the organisation allowed to stay or whether it's open to the general public, whether you can advertise openly or whether there's restrictions on that. So it's really important to speak to the organisations if you're interested in going with one of them, see if they will support your site, see if they will get on board with it and make sure you understand what their restrictions are and what you can do within that. This can be a useful way to test the water before then seeking permission for something more permanent. Don't forget, again, this only applies for to change of use and not operational development. There's four logos here for some of the biggest and most common clubs which offer these exemptions. The full list online is around 11 pages long with a, a big list of, of different organisations with different licences. Um, but again, there's plenty of options out there. There's plenty of people to talk to. So familiarise yourself with what the options are before jumping into anything. To summarise on this, operational development, so physical works, will always need planning permission. You might be able to have a small scale change of use either for up to 28 days a year or through an exempt organisation without needing planning permission. If neither of those apply, then you would need planning permission for change of use. But in reality, most sites are a combination of operational development and change of use and so need permission anyway. For example, the photo shown here, we've got some safari tents. They are technically tented structures, but they're on more permanent bases, which don't then move. So that's operational development. They've also got some garden shed type structures next door to the units, which are also permanent structures for, for washing and things like that. And the site is used all year round. So it doesn't come under a 28 day limit. There's operational development, so it needs planning permission. Okay, moving on to who decides a planning application. So you submit your application to the local planning authority, the council. It's then assessed by a planning officer who is somebody with planning training and qualifications. They invite other consultees to have some input on the application, which will include the parish council, the highways authority, the conservation officer, and potentially many more other people like that. The local ward member, who is your local elected council member, will also be invited to comment and can have input on your application. The general public and any other third parties can also comment either in support or objection, but don't necessarily take objections to heart. A lot of people comment just because they don't like something. They don't have a valid reason, a valid planning reason to do so. The decision is then either made by the planning officer under what's called delegated powers or otherwise voted on at the planning committee by elected planning uh, sorry, elected council members. The reasons for something being referred to planning committee, for example, if it's a particularly big scheme, if it's a particularly controversial scheme, there's been lots of objections, or if the local ward member wants it to be called in if they don't necessarily agree with how the planning officer thinks the application should be assessed. If the application is refused, either by the planning officer or the planning committee, then you have the option to appeal to the planning inspectorate which would then override the original decision. So what gets taken into account with a planning application? So a few things, basically. To start off with, we look at the planning policy, local and national. Is it acceptable to the council in principle? Do they have economic, social and environmental requirements within the planning policies? Some councils will have specific policies on glamping and camping type projects. They might have requirements, for example, that it can only be allowable as part of a farm diversification scheme. Other councils might have, be much more open and support all sorts of things like this. And some councils might be silent altogether, in which case it comes down to a balancing act of demonstrating the benefits versus the harm. It's down to you within the application to set out all of those benefits and demonstrate that they would override that harm. Other material considerations which have to be taken into account are the practicalities of the site. So things like siting and location, how many units you're going to have, what they're going to look like, how they're going to be used. Is there going to be any impact on neighbours and residential amenity? Is there going to be a big visual impact or can they be seen really clearly from public footpaths and things like that? How is the water management and drainage going to be looked after? Are any heritage assets going to be impacted, such as listed buildings, scheduled ancient monuments, things like that? There are three things here which we think are the big deal breakers 
And if you've got a problem with one of these, then you need to find that out sooner rather than later. The first is flooding. So there are maps for you to be able to look at to see whether your site falls within flood risk zone one, two or three. One is low risk, and that's usually an acceptable location for most things. But if you're in flood risk zone two or three, then that's a much higher risk and you've got a much bigger hurdle to overcome to demonstrate that the site is appropriate for what you want to do. Highways is another really important one. If you can't demonstrate safe access to your site, either with an existing access or providing a new access, it's unlikely that the council are going to support anything which brings more people into that entrance. So you need to be looking at your visibility and kind of what the access is like, what's the lane like, how can traffic in the local area be accommodated. If you can't provide this and you can't end up with a safe access, then that's going to be really difficult to overcome. And then the third thing here is designations. The big one being Greenbelt, which is a blanket designation around large urban areas to prevent urban sprawl. In most areas, development in the Greenbelt is it's presumed it's, there's an assumption against any sorts of development unless you can demonstrate very special circumstances. That's not impossible, so it's not an absolute no. But if you are in the green belt, then it's definitely going to add an extra level of complexity to your application. So again, find that out sooner rather than later. Other designations which are still relevant, but perhaps might not be as damning as green belt are things like whether you're in an AOMB, national park, conservation area, all sorts of things like that. Find out early and know what you're dealing with before you get into an application. So the application itself, you submit it to the local authority, including planning application forms, site plans, elevations and floor plans showing what the proposal will look like, a planning statement setting out all of the benefits and how it will meet planning policies, design and access statements, the practicalities of the site, what it'll look like, how it will work in practice, water management and drainage statement setting out how you know how all of that will be managed and potentially other technical supporting surveys such as ecological surveys transport surveys things like that this list is the minimum a lot of councils require more than this so it's important to look at the requirements of your local council to know what you're getting into for example they might want a full-on business plan they might want you to demonstrate renewable energy all sorts of things like that timescales to be aware of there's obviously a certain amount of time to prep the application once it's submitted, most councils at the moment, realistically, have still got delays from COVID-19 and there's quite a lot of backlog for them to get through. So the application is supposed to take eight weeks. In our experience at the moment, most applications are taking longer than that. So if it's particularly time sensitive or you're chomping at the bit to get that decision on that eight week deadline, we would suggest kind of taking a bit of a step back from that because it's unlikely that that's going to happen realistically. There's a few resources on here, which are things for you to, to look at. The map on the top left is from Magic Maps, which is a really useful website where you can search for designations in your area. You can look up things like where the listed buildings are. You can see if you're in the green belt. You can see if you're in an AOMB, lots of different things like that. You can go if you're not sure what local council you're in, you can find that out on through gov.uk using your postcode. So if it's I mean, usually if, it, if the site is at your house or something like that, then it's whoever you pay your council tax to is the local authority that you'd submit your planning application to. But if you're looking at a new site or it's not near your house, then this is where you can go to find out. Once you know the local council, you can look on their own website for similar applications or things like that to kind of give you some prompts on how they've assessed other applications, whether they've supported them or not, what issues they've come up against, which will give you a good idea of how complicated your application might be. The planning portal is also a useful general planning resource, but it helpfully also has the fee calculator. So planning fees vary. Change of use is usually a flat fee of around about £500. If it's operational development, then it usually comes down to how big it is, what the floor area is. So if you, get, you can pre-warn yourself by going on the planning portal and working out whether you're looking at a few hundred pounds or even a couple of thousand. And there's also a gov.uk resource to look at the flood map for planning so you can put your postcode in there and it'll tell you whether you're in flood risk zone one two or three our top tips for a successful application number one seek professional advice we're going to say that we're planning consultants but genuinely especially if you've got a site which is a little bit controversial or there are positives but there's also some negatives and you've got a bit of an argument to overcome 
we will always recommend getting professional advice, whether it's from ourselves or whether it's from technical inputs and things like that, technical third parties, professional advice set will save you a lot of time and money in the long run. There's more than one way to skin a cat. So think about strategy, get professional advice on whether there's any strategies that you can put into place to increase the likelihood of success long term. It could be as simple as applying for a site in stages. So if you know you want to have 12 units on the site, but you know that the council won't support that because that's a big scheme, then apply for a smaller number in the first instance, demonstrate that you've got demand, that there isn't any negative impacts, that it's all working really well, and then extend and expand later. So be ruthless with surveys. So forewarned is for, forearmed. It's tempting to want to avoid extra cost by not going for surveys up front. But again, if there are problems further down the line, then you're better off to find that out up front. And if you can submit an application with as much detail as possible, demonstrating all of these practical elements are covered, then it puts you in a better position. Do your homework, look up other councils, sorry, other applications within the council, look up your designations, make sure you know what you're dealing with on your site and what the council are looking for so that your application tells them what they need to hear to be able to support it. Justify your application, set out the benefits, go into as much detail as you can. For example, economic benefits can be huge. If you're offering a self-catering site, then other shops, pubs, restaurants in the local area are gonna benefit. If you set out which ones are within walking distance or where the nearest ones are and explain, you can even put a monetary value on which other businesses in the local area will directly benefit from your proposal, that will help to demonstrate that those economic benefits again, might just outweigh some harm. Get tactical, if necessary, get political. So I mentioned your local ward member. If you know that there's going to be local objection to the scheme and there's a high chance that people, other local people and neighbours are going to be campaigning to the ward member to object, speak to them first, get them out on the site, invite them to come and see it, get to know you, see what you're looking to do. See if you can get them on board so that you can preempt any problems further down the line and try and get them to support it from the beginning rather than trying to overcome objections later. And keep in touch with your planning officer. Once you submit it, the planning officer will be allocated to the project. You'll get their direct contact details. Don't just leave it with them and assume that they're going to be looking at it and understanding everything that you've submitted. Keep in touch with them. Ask them if they need any clarification. Ask them if they need any extra information. Amend the application if you need to. It's not a, a one way submit it and leave it leave it there kind of process. It's more of an interactive thing than that. And you can, it can go a long way to have a good relationship with your planning officer. Okay, there we go. So that's a whistle stop store of a tour of planning for camping and glamping. Just a little bit more about us. The Rural Planning Company is a trading name of Mole & Co. We're rural chartered surveyors. We've got over 10 years experience in rural planning, including things like camping and glamping, but also agricultural, equestrian projects, farm diversification, rural commercial, barn conversions, village plots, residential projects, all sorts of things like that. We work throughout England and Wales and we're quite happy to have an initial phone consultation free of charge. So do give us a call or drop us an email if you want to discuss something um, over the phone to start off with. And then we will we'll always be honest and upfront with you about what we think your chances are and where we'd, we would suggest going next. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for listening.